there's my mic unmuting itself, there has to be some sort of technical difficulty to begin every broadcast. It's half the fun. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, everybody. I'm your virtual adventure guide here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and welcome to another thrilling broadcast with us. We do about 40 to 50 broadcasts every single month with explorers and scientists around the world, but I am particularly excited because today we continue, we had our last program with them yesterday, we continue our epic Cross Canada virtual road trip series in conjunction with the amazing teams at Parks Canada and Canadian Geographic Education. Just yesterday, we got to hang out with Kluwani National Park talking about their incredible wood frogs. I really encourage you to head to our YouTube channel to check that out. Every program we do in this series will be recorded and online forever if you want to follow up with your classes or families after the fact. Before I dive in with today's topic, I do want to note we are going to have a Kahoot today. So if you want to play along with us with a little quiz between the talk and the Q&A portion, we'd love to have you take part. The game pin is below. You can pull that up as a separate tab in your computer, and I will share that again before we get underway. Now, I will say in advance of our program today, the most exciting time for me over the entire summer was booking my incredible time camping at a Parks Canada site. I'm in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, so my closest national park is Grosse Moore, one of the gems of Canada and the world's park systems. And I'm so excited to get to go there this summer and go on an adventure again with my family. Now, I grew up learning to camp from a really, really young age, but for many of you, you've never gone camping, maybe you've gone once, maybe you'd like to learn a little more. And so today we're joined by a multifaceted team from across Parks Canada system to talk about how to learn to camp safely and respect local wildlife, go find some of the amazing creatures we can observe and identify and check out in Canada's national parks and just have a really, really spectacular and life-changing experience. And so with that in mind, I'm going to bring in Aaron and Janelle from Parks Canada to blow our minds with Learn to Camp and Tracking Wildlife today. Thank you both so much for being here today. Aaron's as excited as I am. Janelle's as excited as I am. It doesn't happen very often, but we've got your presentation up. We are good to go. And thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you, Jesse. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Tracking Wildlife. Janelle and I are part of the Learn to Camp team where we spend our summers taking people just like you outside and showing them how to have fun in nature. Today, it is our pleasure to take you on a whirlwind trip around the country where we're going to introduce you to three of Canada's most iconic animals, teach you how to track them and talk about how to stay safe around them. Our presentation today is gonna to be filled with parts where we are going to need you to help us find things and solve some problems. So get ready to jump into the chat to share your answers. By the end of our 20 minutes together, you're all going to be itching to head outside on your next outdoor adventure. Before we start tracking these animals though, who are we? Hello again, I am Aaron and I use he, him pronouns and I'm joining you all today from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, which is located in Mi'kmaq, the unsurrendered and unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people who have been here since time immemorial. My name is Janelle and I use the pronoun she, her. I'm located in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan today, which is located in the traditional unceded territory of the First Nations of Treaty 6, including the Cree, Dene, Nakoda, Soto, Ojibwe, and Métis peoples. I'm very grateful to be able to live, work, and play on this land and to be connected with all of you virtually today. We also just want to take a moment to say Chag Pesach Sameach, Ramadan Mubarak, and Happy Easter to everyone who's with us today. Now, Aaron and I work for Parks Canada, which is a national agency that protects and preserves Canada's nature and history for people just like you to enjoy. Parks Canada has parks and sites all across the country, which you can see on this map here. Our national parks are the green dots, our national historic sites are the red dots, and our national marine conservation areas are the blue dots. Every year, more and more people are finding out about our amazing places, which is great, but it also means that there's more and more people who don't always know which animals they're sharing the forest with. So it's our goal today to take you into the woods with us and give you the skills to both track these animals and keep yourself and the wildlife safe while out in nature. So Aaron, where are we going today? Well, today we're going to be taking a trip across Canada to three different national parks, starting with La Mauricie National Park in Quebec, which looks something like this. A fun fact about La Mauricie is that it has over 150 lakes that you can swim in. Next, we're going to take a plane. We're going to fly all the way east to my neck of the woods to Kejmakujik National Park and National Historic Site, which looks something like this. Kejmakujik is the only park in the country that is also a national historic site, so it's super special in all of our hearts. Finally, we're going to head all the way over to Prince Albert National Park, where Janelle lives, 
and then, which is in Saskatchewan. It looks something like this. You can see it's the perfect place to go hiking, canoeing, and exploring the woods. And a fun fact about Prince Albert is people have been living in that area since before the Egyptian pyramids were built. Now, you all aren't just coming on this trip for fun. There's some work to be done as well. So at each location, we're going to be learning about how to identify different animals, even when the animal might be hiding. Each place we visit is going to feature six things that we'll need to find. The first are footprints. Each park is going to have some footprints from the animal that we're going to meet in the next park. So we'll take a look at these before we go to the next location, and we'll try to figure out who we might meet. The next thing we're going to be looking for is scat, which is a fancy word for poop. So sometimes the easiest way to figure out who's around is to use your nose and find some droppings. We're going to walk you through how to tell if it's a carnivore, omnivore, or herbivore, so you can know when you need to be on high alert. The third are traces. You can usually tell when a certain animal has been around based on how they interact with their environment. So we're going to look at the trees, the snow, and the ground to see if there's any evidence that these animals might be somewhere nearby. We're also going to be looking for sounds. So along with leaving behind some footprints, we're going to hear some sounds that might tell us which animal is nearby. Finally, we're looking, or number five, we're looking for the animal itself. So each park we visit, there is going to be an animal hiding somewhere. And before we find them, we're going to try to guess who it might be based on all the clues that we found. And then we'll check to see if we're right. And then finally, in each park, there's also going to be some people who aren't acting very safely around the animals. So let's find them and teach them how to be safer before they get hurt. Now, with all of this in mind, let's gather outside Parks Canada's national office in Ottawa and get ready for our trip. Boom, here we are in our nation's capital to get started. Look at that beautiful view of the Parliament buildings. So as we're getting ready to zoom off to La Morissy in Quebec, it looks like there are already some clues for us to investigate and follow to the park. Janelle, do you see any of these clues? Hmm. Aaron, what about these footprints here in the bottom? Do they tell us anything about which animal might have left them? That's a great question. Let's take a closer look. Okay, Janelle, this is a pretty funny looking footprint. Does its shape remind you of the foot of any animal that you know? Um, not really, but it does kind of look like a hoof. Yes, you are correct. This animal is from a group called ungulates, which means hoofed animal. Some really common ungulates that you might find on a farm are horses, goats, and pigs, but wildlife can be ungulates too, just like a deer. Most ungulates are herbivores, which means they only eat plants, but some, like pigs, can be omnivores too. Aaron, I have a cool ungulate fact. Did you know the whale's closest living relatives are ungulates? I don't believe you. Ha, okay, nice one. But yep, you heard that right. Whales were not far from becoming hoofed land mammals. Wow. So now that we know there's an ungulate around, let's keep following these tracks to Lamori Sea to see if we can try to find them. Ah, Lamoury Sea, what a beautiful place to be. This place is teeming with animals, but I don't really see any who look like they have hooves. I do really like that rabbit who's sitting around the purple flowers, though. Those purple flowers are called lupins, and they're definitely some of my favorites. So you're telling me there's a lapin in the lupins? I guess it was meant to be. Aaron, we followed those hoof prints here, but I don't see them anymore. Are there any other traces or scat that might help us figure out which animal we're tracking? Well, it looks like there's a pile of scat over here in the bottom right by the birch trees. Can you describe it a little bit, Janelle? Yeah, it looks round and smooth, and it's not very smelly. Exactly. That scat comes from a herbivore. That is an animal that only eats plants. Their poop looks like small little droplets, and it usually doesn't smell very bad. But that doesn't mean we should go around stepping in it. The size of the droplets also corresponds to the size of the animal. So in La Morée Sea, when we go back, you'll see that, that pile of droplets is almost the same size as that rabbit. So this animal must be pretty big. Okay, so herbivore scat equals small, smooth, and round. Got it. Okay. Is there anything else that you're noticing in this forest? Mm, well, these birch trees look a little bit nibbled on. Yeah, good eye, Janelle. These birch saplings, which you can see in the foreground here and in the background here, have definitely been eaten. And this is a telltale sign of the animal who's here with us in the park. This animal is really big. We figured that out from its poop. And it likes to munch on small trees. So if you see trees that have bites taken out of them like this, that could mean that this animal has been around recently. 
And sometimes this animal, when there aren't any predators around, can eat so many of these small trees that they can change the whole makeup of the forest around them. Geez, it must have pretty powerful jaws to chop down an entire forest before it can grow. So I know it's an herbivore from the scat, and I can see the trees that it's been eating, but wait. <laughs> Oh, down. Holy smokes. That is the sound of definitely, that is definitely coming from a big animal. So we know it's an ungulate, so it walks on its hooves. We know it's an herbivore, so we know it eats plants, so we know it's really big. What's the biggest hoofed plant eater that you know, Janelle? A triceratops? You think there's a dinosaur in the park? No, I'm just kidding. But does anybody want to put a guess in the chat? Yeah, let's see. I know we have some classrooms with us, and I know that they may have caught the hint. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, and there's a lot of them where I am in Newfoundland. If anyone wants to join in, we've got elk coming in in the YouTube chat on our Twitter. Moose from Miss Anderson. You moose? I think that might be. I think that might be a good guess. People are definitely on the right track. Let's take a look, Janelle. Boom. There he is. The moose is a pretty big fella. So a fun moose fact, moose can run really fast. In fact, they're even faster than Usain Bolt, who was the fastest man in the world. So if moose were allowed on the Canadian Olympic team, Janelle, we'd win gold every time. That's pretty cool. But speaking of fast, that car is definitely speeding. Aaron, what do you think would happen if an animal ran out of the forest and onto the road in front of a speeding car? Janelle, this is a kid's presentation. We can't talk about that. Well, that's why it's important to obey speed limits, especially in national parks. Sometimes it might feel like you're driving too slow and you'll want to tell whoever is driving to speed up, but know that the speed limits are lower to protect our animal friends and give you enough time to stop in case one runs out of nowhere. Besides, when you're in a national park, going slower is nicer anyway. It gives you the time to take in the beautiful nature that will be all around you. Speaking of, I see some footprints in the mud, but they don't look like the ungulate hooves of a moose. Hmm, let's take a look. Oh yeah, good observation, Janelle. These are totally different from those ungulate tracks we saw earlier. If ungulates walk on their hooves, what part of the foot do you think this animal might walk on? Well, if you took away the pointy shapes at the top, they would look kind of like a human footprint with the base of the foot and the toes. That's actually a pretty good guess, Janelle. This definitely isn't a human because it has those pointy parts, those claws there, but it is a plantigrade which means that it walks on the base of the foot, just like we do as humans. You can tell it has some pretty long fingers there on the tips. What do you think they might use them for? Mm, maybe like rummaging for food and eating? That's right. It's hard to imagine an ungulate using its hooves to feed itself, but plantigrades like a raccoon definitely can with their fingers. Mm, well, Aaron, I can't see anything else that might tell me what this animal is. Let's follow the footprints to the next park on our trip. All right. So here we are in Kejimakujik in my neck of the woods. It's famous for its beautiful lakes and its petroglyphs, which have been carved into the rocks by the Mi'kmaq people for thousands of years. There's also so much wildlife here. Do you see that barred owl up in the hemlock tree? Yeah. It sounds like who cooks for you? <laughs> exactly. Who cooks for you? That's how you know there's a barred owl around. Looks like our plantigrade friend has also been around here recently. Janelle, do you see any clues lying around who might tell us who it is? Mm, well, the first thing that catches my eye is this hemlock tree. It kind of looks like someone's been scratching at it and tearing the bark. Yeah, excellent observation over there on the left. That's some pretty clear evidence of animal activity. This particular animal, it likes to scratch and rub against trees for a few reasons. First of all, it can mark its territory with the scent from its paws and the scratch marks that it leaves on the trees. But second, sometimes, Ooh, it just gets really itchy, and so we'll use that tree to give itself ooh, a good old back scratch. If you see trees like this, it's a good sign that this animal is around. Aaron, watch your step. You almost got that scat all over your shoe. Ooh, close call. Now, Janelle, you would have thought that I would have smelt the scat this big from a mile away. Even, but it even looks like it could weigh over a pound, but it doesn't have any smell at all. This poop is from an omnivore, which is an animal that eats plants and animals. Depending on what it's been eating, its scat might have no scent or even a pleasant smell. Omnivore scat is often tubular and cut, like we can see on the right, and sometimes it can even be in a little pile. 
Because they eat so many different types of food, though, their scat can look different from day to day. The more you know about their scat, the more you'll be able to know about their last meal. Now, it looks like this omnivore has been eating some berries. I can see some of those in the scat through the magnifying glass. And there may even be little bits of fur from some animals that it may have been eating. Okay, well, its scat might not smell, but it sure is making a lot of noise. Holy moly! Ooh, we should probably be careful, Janelle. This animal only makes that sound when it's worried, so we should definitely make sure that we're being extra safe. Do you have any ideas about what animal it could be here in Kajimakujik? Well, I have no doubt in my mind, but let's see if any of the classes know. We Classes, have, feel free to share in the chat now. So many answers in the chat. You guys have been giving all these hints, and we've got like eight people that say bear. we got a beaver thrown in there for good measure, but mostly bear and black bear specifically a few times. It's pretty all exciting. right. So I love that guess of the beaver. That's our mascot. We love beavers, but we got to remember that they are herbivores, not omnivores. At least uh, they're not. They don't eat animals that are super big like this one. So it sounds like the other people are on the right track. We do, in fact, have a black a bear. Black bear. There he is. So compared to grizzly bears and polar bears, black bears like this fella here are usually a little bit less aggressive, but that doesn't mean that we should let our guard down when we're around them. If you see a black bear, it's important to make yourself as big as you can and to loudly and confidently say, hey, bear, nice and loud. Hey, bear. So this way, the bear won't be surprised and you and it will know to avoid you. We can't outrun, outswim, or outclimb a bear. So we're going to back away slowly while confidently making some noise. So we're going to practice. Jesse, I can see you've already brought some classes up. We're going to get everyone to make themselves as big as they can. And we might not be able to hear you, but you should all be saying loudly, hey, bear. Hey, bear. <laughs> Nicely done, Mr. LeBron's class. At home, our other class, their cameras are off. And I hope you're, you're letting the bear know that you're there, wherever you might be joining from. <laughs> Nicely done, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. LeBrun's class. That bear was a little bit close, and we needed that energy from you to keep ourselves safe. So thank you for helping us. Aaron, watch where you're going. You just stepped on some garbage. What? Man, who left all this here? I mean, no wonder the bear was so close. Someone left all of their food and garbage out, and the scents must have attracted them. It's really important when we're outside to leave no trace, which means that we shouldn't leave anything behind. Not only does it make the park gross for other people, but it can also invite animals into our campsites. This is unsafe for us, but it's also unsafe for the animals because the food can make them sick and it can make them dependent on human food instead of what they would normally eat. Even items like sunscreen, bug spray, and toothpaste can attract bears because they smell like candy to them. So make sure to clean up after yourself for everyone's sake. All right, let me just quickly pick up some of this trash here that I'm finding at this picnic bench. All right, there we go. I'm going to take that out of the park with me. And hey, oh, look at this. Well, I was picking up that trash, Janelle. I noticed that there was another animal here. Look at all of these tracks. Must have been attracted Ooh. to the garbage, too. Okay, Aaron. I've got this one. Now, these look kind of like bear tracks. So these must be from a plantigrade, right? Hmm, I guess so. Except they do look kind of similar to the footprints that my dog leaves in the snow. That's correct. This animal is pretty similar to your dog, I bet. Do you see how the toe marks are the biggest part of these footprints? That's how we know that this animal is a digitigrade, meaning that it walks on its digits or its fingers and toes. So if your dog runs fast, I bet this animal does too, and that's by design. Since most digitigrades are carnivores, they use this type of foot to quickly chase down their prey. They might not be able to pick up their food like a plantigrade, but their speed can make up for that. So we know this animal is fast, so quickly let's follow its tracks to the next part before it gets too far away. Ah, what a day to visit PA. Prince Albert National Park, that is. Look at all these amazing colors. Yeah, I see the other class was actually, they got ahead of us. I can see that beaver they were predicting over there in the river. And it even looks like it's your favorite bird, Janelle, a gray jay, in that tamarack tree on the left. That's right, Aaron. We've made it to my neck of the woods and at my favorite time of year, too. Since we're farther north now, you may notice that there's even snow on the ground. Do you see any evidence of that digitigrade around here? Hmm. There does 
seems to be a funny looking hole in the snow, uh, sort of in the bottom right of this scene. Yeah, nice find. That animal that's around here somewhere likes to hunt in the snow. It uses its big ears to track down rodents, and then it will leap up into the air and dive down into the snow to catch them, leaving holes just like this one behind. Uh, it must have been hunting pretty recently because I smell something terrible. Ugh, yuck. <laughs> You've just found some carnivore scat. This stuff is usually pretty smelly because it's full of bones and guts. Carnivore scat tends to be long and narrow, and you can see here that it usually contains fur or bones from whatever animals it's been eating. Because they're filled with other animals, their scat can be really stinky. Ugh. So, long, slender, and smooth, and containing fur and bones means that it's carnivore scat. Does that mean that it's likely a predator? Yep, bingo. Do you hear that, Janelle? I, I think that there's a bird around somewhere. Don't look up, Aaron. Look down instead. That's the sound of carnivore that's around here somewhere. Do you have any idea what it could be? I've got it. I know Mr. Anderson's class already has a guess, but I, I've got it. It's a flightless eagle. Uh, no, Aaron, a flightless eagle? Come on. Does anybody else have any ideas? We've got a lot of groups with ideas. And on YouTube, I will note Sarah Dowell got this like spot on after the first clue. Our live groups have it, but Fox is our universal pick for this, which is fantastic. That's correct, everyone. It is a fox. Although, Aaron, I might be confused, or I understand why you might be confused. Foxes can make over 40 sounds, so it can be really easy to confuse them with other animals. These sounds are from baby foxes playing with their family. Do you know what a fox family is called? They're called a skulk. I mean, that does make sense, since he was definitely skulking around there behind that tree. Hey, Janelle, before we go, we should probably talk to this person who's taking a selfie with a squirrel. Why? What's wrong with that? It's just a squirrel. Well, we need to remember that wildlife is just that. Wild. So if you want, uh, so, and so you want to make sure that you're always staying a safe distance away from them. If you're taking a selfie, you are way too close. To know if you're a safe distance away from an animal, any animal, no matter how big, you can always check using your thumb. To do that, you're going to cover one eye with one hand and hold your other arm out all the way with your thumb up. If you can cover that animal up with your thumb, that means you're a safe distance away. And if you can't cover it up, you got to back away a little bit more until you can cover it. And that's how you know you're going to be a safe distance away from that animal. Also, we have to remember that when we're taking a selfie, we're putting ourselves in even more danger because we're turning our back on the animal, even if we're looking at them through the camera. And we never want to do that. We always want to be facing animals and remaining alert. And this is true for even a tiny squirrel, and it's especially true for larger animals like our fox here or the moose and the bear that we met earlier. Enjoy your animals from a safe distance to keep yourself and the animals safe. So use your thumb and don't take selfies with animals. Got it. Hey, there's one more set of tracks on the ground here though. Should we see where these lead? Let's go. Oh, hey, it looks like we ended up at a campsite. Look at what a good job these campers are doing. Their campsite is clean and they can easily put their food away before bed. They're viewing wildlife from a safe distance by using their thumb. And since the animals are sleeping so peacefully, I bet they drove here at a safe speed too. This looks like the perfect place, Janelle, to end our presentation and roast up some marshmallows. But before we go, we want to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us in our tour of three different national parks. It was a lot of fun to share them with you. We also want to say thank you to Paul Hammond who made all of these beautiful art pieces for you today. We're also, uh, you're gonna have a chance to ask us questions in a moment, but first we just wanna review everything that we've talked about today. So the first thing was scat or poop. As a recap, herbivore scat is spherical and it's in the shape of a ball, which there are plenty of. It's usually smooth and dry and sometimes it may contain berries or plants. Omnivore scat is usually tubular, textured and cut. Often, you can tell what the animal's last meal was just by looking at the scat, and it doesn't smell very bad. Carnivore scat, however, is slender, elongated, and it has a smooth shape. It likely contains the fur and bones of other animals, and it makes it smell pretty strongly if you get too close. So that's the scat. Next, we're going to see how well you remembered the sounds that these animals make. So I'm going to play a sound, and then you can all type in the chat to say what animal you think it is. 
but we're going to try to trick you. So the right sound may not be next to the right animal. So that sound next to the moose could be from a moose or from a fox or a bear. So I'm going to play them and everyone can quickly type in the chat. We're going to start over here in the corner. <laughs> definitely heard that before. <laughs> we did. <laughs> that animal is worked up. Oh, private chat, moose and fox. Oh, and mo moose, moose, sorry. Moose is our universal pick. There we go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's right. This is a moose and that's a bull moose. Well, I'll be letting everyone know that it's around. Well done, everyone. We're going to try a different one here. Who knows what animal this is? A flight with you go. Flightless right. eagle. The classic flightless <laughs> eagle title the over program. Canada. Fox is our, our pick from everyone. Fox is coming in. Yeah, that's right. That is the fox making one of his over 40 sounds. Then finally, one last sound. <laughs> By process of elimination, bear is coming in from everyone. Way to go. You guys are such a on-the-ball audience today. I love it. So yeah, this is great to see. You're all clearly on top of your animal sounds. So one last thing to review quickly is the different kinds of tracks. There are digitigrades who walk on their toes like a dog or a fox. There are plantigrades who walk on their whole paw or foot like a bear or a human. And there are ungulates who walk on their hooves like a moose, an elk, or a pig. So now we've reviewed all of that, Jesse has a Kahoot quiz for you. And then after that, we'll be here to answer any questions that you might have. Outstanding. Aaron Janelle, thank you for such an incredible tour. We have learned so much about some amazing animals. I will echo the thanks to Paul Hammett. That was an amazing bunch of artwork. So I really encourage, uh, uh, again, all our students, if you guys are really excited about art, draw yourselves, draw whatever you can find out in nature. It really does go a long way to helping you retain those concepts and you get some really beautiful stuff out of it. Kahoot, folks. I know a lot of you are new to Kahoot. So the faster you answer these questions, the more points you get. You don't win anything, but you do win. Aaron, Janelle, and I's everlasting respect for having paid close attention to this amazing program. So please do chime in. Our pin's up on the screen. We're going to get started pretty shortly, uh, and we're really excited to dive in. When we're done, we're going to head to Mr. LeBrun's class first for a question live. We've got Bayside and Ms. Anderson's class who will share with us in the StreamYard chat, and like a gazillion of you on YouTube who can share any questions you'd like in the chat there. Please feel free to start sharing questions anytime as I get us underway with our Kahoot. Uh, Aaron, Janelle, if you want to help us out with hints when there's a few seconds to go in each question, you are welcome to chime in uh, and we'll, we'll get underway, see what people thought. All right. <sighs> Question number one. Which of these scats is from a moose? Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Is it our top left guy? Our thing that looks more like what your dog might do bottom left or the one on the far right. I'll make the screen a little bit bigger so that you can see some of these things. I know we got some image based ones today. Eight answers so far. We're tricking people up. Get those answers in, everybody. Get them in, get them in. 22 answers. Okay, most people picked our correct answer. Way to go in the bottom left. Our yellow guy. Fantastic. Let's see where that puts our leaderboard. Golden Wildcat in the lead. Uh, as we go along, if you are any of these folks, let us know who you are in the chat, especially when we get to the podium at the end. All right. What should you do if you encounter a bear? And a big hint, we did this together like seven minutes ago. Do you curl up into a ball? Do you say, hey, bear, nice and loud? Do you go pet the cubs? Seems like a good idea. Or do you climb a tree? Hmm. I think we're going to definitely veto pet the cubs. You're not going to go pet the cubs for any animal. You're going to maintain that safe distance like we talked about. 39 answers and 36 of you said, hey, bear, two of you want to curl into a ball. Uh, not the best option. Hey, bear, it, just let an animal know you're there. Just like it's nice. You don't want to be snuck up on by anyone. Raise those arms. And uh, that does help a lot. Way to go, everybody. All right. How does that affect our leaderboard? Golden Wildcat still in the lead going to question three. Which of these tracks comes from a fox? Hmm. Is it one, two, three, or four? We've got these big, thick ones with claws. We've got something that looks maybe uh, like one of our earlier creatures. Bottom left. What do we think, everybody? 24 answers in. Oh, now you're pouring in. Almost over 50 of you in our Kahoot now. Way to go, everybody. Our answer is yes. You guys are on the ball today. 52 of you got the correct answer with our fox and the, the yellow again. Cheerful Owl takes our lead. <gasps> Spoilers. What's going to happen? It's question number four, and then we're going to Mr. LeBruns for a question. 
why shouldn't you leave garbage around in the outdoors? If anyone's ever done a cahoot with me before, you'll know that there's an answer we like to do in questions like this, but it can make animals sick. It makes a mess that someone else has to clean up. It can make animals depend on human food or all of the above. Mm, might not be our yellow today. We're falling to the yellow answers in this code, but no, 45 answers in, all of the above. The other answers are all correct. And so again, we don't want to make animals sick. We don't want to leave something that other people have to clean up and we don't want to have it where animals think of humans as being the providers of their food out in the wild. Great job, guys. That was like the best ratio for Kahoot good answers we've ever had in our history. So nicely done. Aaron and Janelle did an amazing job teaching you guys. Awesome Raven, Dr. Duck, and our winner of our Kahoot, let you, us know who you are. Decisive Panda was especially decisive today. Way to go. Uh, Mr. LeBron's class, I'm going to head to you guys live. YouTubers, please feel free to start sharing questions too. Uh, but come on in, unmute your mic, and uh, take us away in Mississauga. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, thanks for having us. Lily has a question for you. What about bird feeding? Is that safe? Bird feeding, good question. Janelle, do you want to take it? Aaron, do you want to take this one? <laughs> sure, I'm happy to. So it can definitely be really fun to put some bird seed in your hand and hold it out there and have the birds come and take some seed away from your hand. And we would say that, uh, especially in Parks Canada places where the animals are really wild and there aren't many people around, that that kind of activity could make them dependent on us and we don't want that. But when we're in cities and there are bird feeders and lots of people around, the birds are already going to be accustomed to eating some bird seed. And so watching birds at a bird feeder in your backyard feels like it could be a, a safe decision that isn't going to disrupt the birds too much. Yeah. I'm really, really glad we got that question. So thank you for that. Because again, most of us, when we're familiar with animals and feeding and interacting with animals, bird feeding is sort of like our classic go-to thing. So it just depends on the context. And again, if you're in a Parks Canada site or a provincial park uh, across Canada, city major park, uh, it's a little bit of a different story. So great job, guys. Uh, live classes, StreamYard, please feel free to share questions. Bayside Public School from Mia wants to know what happens after doing the strategies you suggested and a bear still goes for you. So if you've got, hey bear, and the bear keeps on walking right up, is it one of the other things? Curl up in a ball, climb a tree, or what do you do next, you two? That's a very good question, Mia. Now, if the bear is still approaching you, you're gonna to wanna to stay calm, keep making yourself big, keep saying hey bear, and back away really, really slowly. Now, if the bear is still approaching you after this, we're gonna hope that an adult in your group has some bear spray with you. And if an adult has some bear spray, always bring bear spray with you when you go out in nature. You can use that bear spray to sp spray the bear directly in the face and then it'll sting its eyes. It works kind of like a pepper spray and the bear will go away. Yeah. Good question. When I went to Banff National Park, my uh, time out in, uh, near Calgary, that was the first thing that was recommended was to go buy bear spray. I had it when I went on the trails. I never encountered a bear, but it was good to have as a backup. So great question, guys. Miss Anderson's class, do you guys have your devices working? So I'm gonna come try and check and see if we can have you live for Phil's question. Uh, and if not, you've shared it in the chat, but Windsor, let's see if we can get this working. If you wanna unmute your mic. There you go, Phil. Hey, Phil. What is the most common snake found when camping? Nice, more common snake. That is a great question. I know people are often really fascinated by snakes. And Janelle, maybe you can talk about what the snake population looks out in the prairies. But in Nova Scotia, at least, there's going to be a lot of like of gardener snakes and a lot of really safe snakes, maybe some water snakes as well. And so they're they're cute, but they're not necessarily anything to worry about. They're not poisonous, they're not going to bite us. And so um, and so they're safe to view from a distance. So we don't have to be too worried, at least in Nova Scotia. Janelle. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question, Phil. It's going to depend on where you're going. So in most places in Canada, the snakes are pretty harmless. Like Aaron said, there's going to be lots of garter snakes around. Um, some places in southern Saskatchewan and Alberta, you might find a rattlesnake, uh, but they're definitely not common and they're still pretty rare if you see them, but it's going to depend on where you're going. And then where I am in Newfoundland, there are no snakes, which is really sad because I have a bumper sticker that says, please break for snakes. And now it's of no use to me at all, although it is very nice. So if anyone wants to please break for any animal, it's great. Um, on YouTube, we got a question from Ms. Travelex's class. Is it rare to see a bear, which also functions as cheap poetry? So there you go. Are you likely to see a bear anywhere you go or not? I would say that how you prepare for your trip is going to impact whether or not you see a bear. So like we mentioned, especially with black bears, they're often more scared of us than we are of them. So if we're making lots of noise, they're going to leave us alone. But 
let's say we go camping and we decide to not clean up our campsite and we go for a little hike and we leave our tent for an hour and there was an open bag of marshmallows or once I saw some people camping, they ordered a pizza and uh, they left it in their tent. And that kind of smell is going to be really exciting to an animal, especially when it's something they might not have smelled before. So they'll be really interested in what it could be. And so if you're leaving garbage around, you're leaving your food out, you're not making a lot of noise. Those could be situations where a bear could come around and, and see what's going on. So I would say when you're just walking through the woods, I go on lots of hikes and sometimes maybe once or twice a year, I'll encounter a black bear, but that trick of just letting it know that I'm there and it sees me and it gets bored and it walks away. But if I'm leaving food out, that's going to be the recipe for attracting bears. So you always want to make sure you clean up your campsite and you don't leave garbage around when you're out in nature. Great. Another thing I want to add to this one too, if you are going out on a hike in nature and you are somewhere where you know there's bears around, if you're making lots of noise with your group, you're being loud, bears will hear you coming and bears are usually really afraid of people. So if you're out in a group and you're making lots of noise, they'll hear you coming and then they'll walk away before you see them. Yep. Great job, guys. I actually have a quick follow-up from this because uh, Miss, uh, our Bayside Public School kind of wanted to know what happens if a bear goes in your tent? You're out camping, you're relaxed, you're peaceful, you left the tent flap open, and the bear comes in to maybe investigate some food. What then? <laughs> So we'll just, we'll reiterate again, don't leave food in your tent, even toothpaste, anything that might have a smell to it could attract one of those animals. But let's say we forgot, we have some toothpaste in our tent, we come back from a hike and there's a bear sniffing around. Well, like we said before, that bear is going to be really into its activity. It might not see us. So as long as it's a black bear, we're going to nice and loudly say, hey, bear, so it knows we're around. And then we would back up slowly. And if we have a car nearby, I would get inside that car or if there's like a washroom or something in the campground, just get yourself to shelter because you are really close to the bear. Yep. And I would, if you're in a national park, I would call the ambassadors or the campground staff and they'll be able to give you more advice about the bears in that area. I have called Parks Canada staff at like one in the morning when I've locked myself out of a yurt and they will be there. So Parks Canada staff are like on the ball if you ever need any help. Uh, speaking of, of sort of potentially dangerous animals in certain situations, uh, Allison wanted to know, are moose dangerous specifically? That's a really good question. Um, it, uh, moose can be very dangerous. Moose are really big animals and they are really easily spooked. So same thing if you're out in bear country, if you're hiking on trails, you just wanna make lots of noise when you're out. And if the moose hear you coming, they will go away even quicker than bears do because moose are really afraid of people. So it's pretty unlikely that you see a moose, but if you do see one, same thing, stay calm back away slowly, try not to scare the animal, and then hopefully it won't get scared. Yep. Great point, guys. I will note, uh, it's funny because this is like the big thing when you move to Newfoundland is everyone talks about driving with moose. So you just take extra attention at night. You have your high beams on. If your place is in Ontario or across Canada that you happen to be in moose country, uh, at night, just drive a little more slowly, obey those speed limits like we talked about in the program. It's another way to avoid any potential problems with wildlife. Guys, time flies and we're having fun. I'm going to take a couple more questions before we wrap up. Mr. LeBrun's class, if you guys want to come on in, you can unmute your mic and you're good to go. Hey. Absolutely. We've got Seraphine, whose birthday it is today. So she's got a special question for you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Why doesn't some animal scat smell? Ooh. That's a great question. What you want me to take it? <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm having tech issues and I only heard half the question. Aaron, okay. do you want to take this one? Happily. Yeah, no problem. So the scat is going to smell based on what an animal has been eating. So if it's been eating grass or other plants, those aren't going to release the same sort of enzymes and bacteria when they're being digested by the animal. And so the poop's going to be really dry. It's not going to have a lot of a smell to it. But if it's been eating an animal in the same way that if you go to your compost bin and you maybe smell an old head of lettuce versus an old piece of meat that's in there, that meat, when it decomposes, just smells a lot worse. Um, so it, it depends a lot on what they've been eating. And also, depending on the animal, the smell of their scat might help them indicate where their territory is and let other animals know that they're around, that they're hunting there. Yeah, that was a really detailed answer. Thank you for that, Aaron. Um, I'm going to head to Ms. Anderson's class for one final question to wrap us up. If you guys want to come in and unmute your mic, you are good to go. Hey, Windsor. <laughs> Oh, unmute for us, though. There you go. All right. There we go. Hey. Hi. Um, my question is, what is the most seen animal while camping? Ooh, the most seen Ooh. animal while camping. The most seen animal. Well, 
out here in Nova Scotia, it depends where you're camping. If you're camping in the city and there's some nice campgrounds around here, like Shuby Park, where you can go camping, there are lots of raccoons. And they're always on the lookout for like bags of marshmallows and food they might be leaving out. So they're really, really common. And when we're going into our national parks in Nova Scotia, well, you're always going to see squirrels and there are some raccoons too. But usually I would say the most common type of animal you see are birds. So you're going to see lots of red-winged blackbirds and thrushes and terns. And um, they're always diving down to eat all the bugs that are hovering just over the water. So I'd say Squirrels, raccoons, and all the different birds that we have here in Nova Scotia are the ones that I always see the most when I'm out in the woods. Nice. Janelle, what about you? What's... I always see mosquitoes the most because they're always biting me. But if we're talking about animals that aren't bugs, it's going to depend on where you are. We don't have raccoons out here in the prairies as much as a lot of other places in Canada do. So out here, the most common animals, same thing, are birds and lots of squirrels around too. Yeah, I actually got the chance to go to Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan a couple of years ago, and there were prairie dogs, there were bison. It was like the most incredible thing ever. It's such a beautiful, unique part of the world. And in Newfoundland, we just had a moose swim right in front of our tent, right out in the water. Uh, what an incredible experience. So wherever you are, this is the joy of Parks Canada. It's the joy of this Cross Canada Virtual Road Trip series, is you guys are having the chance to hear about some of the most amazing places uh, on the planet, uh, whether it's culture and heritage, biodiversity, some amazing places and, and opportunities to camp. Uh, I really do encourage you to check out our road trip series. There's so many more programs on the go. All these are going to be on our YouTube channel too. So if you want to head to check out this program again, our Kulani friends, any of our other programs, there's a lot to discover every single day. Aaron and Janelle, this has been so much fun. I know we could talk about this all day long, but we are ending the near end of our broadcast. So if there's any final message you two want to share with our kids before we bring up, you are uh, the the floor is ours before Jesse can even finish his sentence. Yeah, just <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us. We really love getting people out in nature and making people feel passionate about the outdoors. So we really hope that you identify a park, whether that's a little park in the city or maybe there's a larger park that you can get lost in the woods in with your family. Go take those opportunities to get outside, connect with nature, and then try to apply the things we've talked about today so that you can try to track some animals and maybe you can even impress your family by identifying some poop or some tracks. You can say, I know that's a jitter grade because I learned that on the uh, Exploring by Senior Pants Cross Canada road trip. Yes, just to follow Aaron, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Aaron and I had a lot of fun both making and delivering this presentation. We hope all of you can get outdoors either right now, it's winter where some of us are, or in the spring or summer, whenever you want to, whatever works for you. Um, and just make sure that you're doing it safely so that you and all of the animals out in nature are safe and having a good time. Thank you. Fantastic. YouTube, thank you so, so much for this. Thanks on, on YouTube for the great feedback, uh, joining us here in our banners for our StreamYard class. It's really, really nice. We really appreciate this more than you know. Uh, and guys, what we're going to do is bring in Mr. LeBrun's class. You guys want to unmute your mic and say a big thank you and farewell. You are in the thank broadcast. You. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye, bye. our classes, YouTube.